start by showing you a couple of examples of choices that were made and then the results that followed as a, as a result of these choices. So first I want to show you two positive examples, okay? The woman on the left is a woman named Malala Yousaf, Yousafzai. Uh, when she was 11 years old, some of you may recognize her, she was, uh, she was very brave and she made a decision to write a blog about her life in Pakistan uh, at a time when a terrorist organization was kind of taking over in her region. And her decision to just write a blog, that, that was it. Her decision to write a blog, uh, it ended up changing her entire life. Uh, that blog kind of launched her into public notoriety. She experienced a lot of challenges, if you know the story. Uh, but eventually, she became an international icon as an activist. She has sat with presidents. She has influenced global policy, like very, very big public, uh, public figure. And it started with her decision to write a blog. The woman on the right, is named Frances Perkins. And uh, Frances was having tea with some friends one day in New York when they heard a bit of a commotion outside. And she made a decision, rather than just sitting there with her friends and not caring about what was going on around her, she made a decision, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna see what, it, what is happening and I'm gonna look. And her decision to step outside, she ended up witnessing uh, a fire that was happening in New York. New York. I, I think it's still considered, uh, if not the deadliest, one of the deadliest fires uh, in the history of New York. Uh, it's, it's called like the tri Triangle Factory Fire or something. I, I might be getting that wrong, but uh, over like 100 people ended up losing their lives in this fire that Francis witnessed. And her witnessing this tragic event actually catapulted her into a life of championing for social work. After she saw the working conditions of these people who ended up dying in this fire, uh, she totally made a decision to uh, really change the, 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 the degree of passion which she invested into her work and the trajectory of her life in many ways. Uh, and that started with a decision to go outside and to see what was happening. Now, those are positive examples or uh, decisions that made to good outcomes. I wanna show you some negative ones. The headline at the very top of that slide is the story of Adrian Peterson, who is a former NFL player. Uh, he made somewhere around $100 million in his NFL career, but as you can see, he is currently in debt. Uh, with, or, or he currently has about $12 million in debt. He had the ability to create generational wealth. If you're unfamiliar with numbers, $100 million is a lot of money, and yet, because of his bad decisions, he created the opposite effect. He uh, is very likely not going to be able to leave the legacy that he once was gonna be able to leave. The headline in the middle is about Robert Sandifer, who uh, he made a decision to get involved with the Chicago gang when he was just a kid. He committed several crimes for the gang, including murder, but when the gang started to worry that he was going to turn himself into authorities, they shot him. And then the headline on the bottom tells the story of a 20-year-old kid in Long Beach who uh, he made a decision one night to just get drunk with his friends uh, and then to get behind the wheel of his car and drive. And the result is he ended up taking the lives of an entire family because he made a decision to drive under the influence. The result for his life is anywhere from 25 years in prison to life. And here's my point in sharing all of these stories. Every single one of those individuals made a series of choices that either produced a life that they were very proud of and that we all admire, or they made a series of choices that resulted in a tragic tale for us to learn from. And I'd be willing to bet money on the fact that for some of them, if not all of them, when they were making those choices, they did not understand the significance of those decisions especially in that moment. As Malala wrote her blog in her room, I think it's very unlikely that she could have anticipated by doing this small action, uh, I'm going to become an international activist who changes the course of women's education rights all across the world. As Robert Sandifer was just having fun with his friends and going along with the crowd, I don't think he ever considered the fact that the people he trusted most would take his life as that young man decided to just hang out with his friends and have a couple drinks. I don't think he ever considered that his actions would end up ruining the lives of other people forever, especially, or, uh, including his. But the reality is, is whether we think about it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, our decisions, they all have consequences. And not every decision leads to life and death or success and tragedy, but every decision does lead us somewhere which is why Jesus gets to the end of his Sermon on the Mount, and in a way, he kind of just stops teaching 
altogether. He stops giving out instructions or guidance, at least in the way that he's been doing, because this is the part of the sermon where he has said everything that he needs to say. If you read Matthew chapter five and six, and then that first half of seven, uh, you get quite a bit of instruction. But now he's given his insight, he's given his wisdom, he has invited people into the kingdom of God, he's provided his vision for how humanity can flourish, and now he gets to the end of his sermon, and he essentially tells his listeners, okay, now you have a choice. And your choice is gonna come with consequences. Here's what he says. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus is presenting his audience here with two different ways to live, two different ways to live. And this is actually a classic technique that is done by sages and prophets, both within Jewish history as well, as within like uh, uh, Greek philosophy. I'll show you some examples real quick. So uh, Joshua, he told the people this. He said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites. So just notice Joshua goes, choose which gods you're gonna serve. Uh, Joshua kind of stole this technique from Moses who said it in Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses said, see, I set before you today life and prosperity death and destruction. Again, just notice the two options for people to choose from. And even before the sages and the prophets used this idea, God used it. Look at what, he tell, look at what God tells Adam in Genesis chapter two. Uh, he, uh, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, it isn't super explicit how he is saying that you have two ways uh, at least he doesn't use those, those uh, particular words, but just notice the contrast. From the very beginning of our creation story, God creates humanity to love them, to be his creative partners on the earth. He puts them in this garden and he tells them, uh, you have two options. You have two ways to live. You can live my way in my world and experience all of the garden, but this way includes you not eating from the restricted tree. Or, You can choose your own way. You can eat from this tree, but that way leads to death. And if you're familiar with the Genesis story, you know that they end up eating from the tree, but when they eat from the tree, uh, they don't die right away. At least they don't die the way that we think of death. Uh, Their connection to God dies right away, but they remain physically alive uh, until eventually then they do like physically die. So when God told, uh, told them, hey, if you eat from the restricted tree, you're going to die. I just want you to notice that part of their consequence, it occurred right away. There was a spiritual death. There was a disconnect from God. But the other part of their consequence, the physical death, that doesn't occur until the future. So their choice had consequences in both their present moment and in their future. Just remember that idea for later. Now, my point in showing you the example of Joshua, of Moses, and right here, is that all of these examples illustrate what Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 7. He uh, is doing the same thing that God has always done throughout human history, which is giving people choice, giving people two choices about which way they're going to live. In life, there are at least two ways to live, and Jesus describes those two options as follows. He says there is a wide and easy way that leads to destruction, or there is a narrow and a hard way that leads to life. Now, if you've been following the flow of uh, the sermon, you kind of, you, you can pick up, like if you read five, six, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 all at one time, you can kind of pick up that the easy way that Jesus is talking about is the same way of life that he's been critiquing throughout the sermon. Uh, this life is, de- is defined by things like hypocrisy, self-righteousness, living for the approval or the applause of other people, and more. If Jesus were giving this sermon in our cultural context, he may identify the easy way of life as just going along with the crowd, doing what everyone else does, never considering how you live before God or other people uh, as long as you're not hurting anyone else. And what I find fascinating about Jesus's metaphor here, if you notice particularly that top line, is that Jesus connects the easy way to the result of destruction, which means the easy way or the easy thing is not always the right thing, the easy thing is not always the good thing. 
because we all live in uh, 21st century America, Western world, like we live in such a technologically advanced society. Uh, product developers know that if they want us to buy their products or give them money, like they have to convince us, hey, we're gonna make your life better, so we're gonna make your life easier. It can be very logical for all of us to fall into the trap of thinking that easy always equals good or easy always equals better. Think about it. If ChatGPT can write my papers for me and make my life easier, that's good. But if I have to sit down and go through the boredom, the frustration, and the mental energy of doing that myself, well, that's, that's not good. If my parents buy me whatever I want, whenever I want it, my life then becomes easier, that's good. But if I'm told I have to save up my own money or that is not something we're buying right now, that feels bad. In general, if my life is going the way I want it to, then it probably feels pretty easy. But if I'm experiencing challenges or uncomfortable feelings, well then I would probably describe my life or my season as bad. And though I understand the sentiment behind those ideas, the reality is an easy life is not inherently a good life. And a difficult life is not inherently a bad life. As a matter of fact, many of the really good things that we want in life, they're the opposite of easy. Some of us wanna make a lot of money. It is very possible, it's not easy. Most people, their income peaks around the age of 50. So if you're talented, you work hard, uh, and you kind of can work your way up in an industry uh, where uh, you're able to then take your money and invest and build wealth and stuff, like you can make a lot of money. It takes a couple decades and a lot of work. Some of us wanna get into a romantic relationship one day where we can have someone who we trust, someone who we could build a life with, very possible, it is extremely difficult to have a relationship that is not marked by jealousy or insecurity, but one that's actually marked by trust, one where two people are working together on a shared vision and a common goal. Some of us want better friendships. We just want people who we like and people we respect, people who we can have a good time with and trust and be comfortable around. Very possible, but developing good friendships takes a long time. In my experience, it takes years. Some of us wanna get really great at our craft, whatever we do, make an impact on the world. Very possible, it's not easy. Malcolm Gladwell says that it usually takes about 10,000 hours for somebody to master something. And my point here is that many of the best things in life are not easy, and yet it is very natural for all of us to want an easy life. So here's a question I want you to consider. Where have I chosen what's easy instead of what's good? Where have I chosen what's easy instead of what's good? Perhaps you've chosen the easy AI assistant instead of challenging yourself as a writer. Perhaps you've chosen the route of avoiding conflict uh, because it feels uncomfortable rather than leaning into a conversation with someone that you know needs to be had. Perhaps you've chosen to just keep your sin a secret instead of choosing to confess and to work on it. Perhaps you've chosen to stay in an unhealthy and an unwise relationship because it's just easier doing that than it is going through the heartbreaking process of finding someone else, finding new friends, or just being single. And to be clear, I'm not saying easy is bad, but I am saying that we should pay attention to the trap of chasing an easy life at, an expen at the expense of a good one. Because Jesus says that there is a life that is easy. There is an, there is an easy way that leads to destruction. If you remember the consequence for humanity in the garden, God says you're going to die, and right away they spiritually die, but their physical death took much longer. Their consequence, it was both something that happened right there in their current moment, and it was something that happened in the future. And that's one way to think about the consequences that Jesus is describing in our passage. Uh, when we choose the easy path and we live life kind of however we think is best, and we ignore the wisdom and the guidance of Jesus, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus says that those people will experience destruction, and that is destruction both now and in the future. The word that Matthew uses for destruction uh, in that verse is the Greek word uh, apolia, and it carries with it this idea of something being ruined, as if something no longer functions the way that it was intended to. So a destroyed car is one that can't transport people, a destroyed watch is one that can't tell time, and a destroyed human 
is one that cannot love God and others the way they were designed to. So if you try ignoring the wisdom of Jesus on things like relationships or conflict resolution, violence or personal holiness, uh, you can kind of watch how those areas of life end up getting destroyed. And destruction has a future sense. Uh, That word is used in other places in the New Testament to refer to the final state of humans who just reject God altogether because the heart that always wants its own way in this life usually also wants its own way in the next life. But as you can see, there is an alternative. Jesus presents one way of life as easy and leading to destruction, but he also presents another way as hard but leading to life. And similar to his idea of destruction, life means something for right now in our everyday experience, and it means something for the future. Uh, We'll go to the next slide. If you look at those words on the left-hand side of the screen, the Apostle Paul writes down those words and says that that describes a Christian's experience of life here on this earth. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The idea is that the longer we follow Jesus, the more those things should describe our inner reality. And in another place, the Apostle Paul says on the right-hand side of the screen, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In other words, the life that Jesus offers us is better now It's marked by good things now, and it's marked by an unimaginable life in the future. But that life is what Jesus says is not easy to get. Here's how the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright describes discipleship to Jesus. He says it this way, following Jesus means we have to live differently. We can't just coast along in life following our own dreams and desires and hope that uh, we're somehow becoming more Christ-like in the process. Instead, We're called to live a life of costly discipleship, laying aside our comfort and preferences for the sake of the kingdom. And this is why Jesus says, there is an easy way that leads to destruction, but there is a hard way that leads to life. Because following Jesus is not easy, but it is good and it is fulfilling. And in the midst of a culture where we would be celebrated for following just about anything, from politics to money to relationships to fame, we all believe that there is something or someone out there that if I could just get that, if I could just have that job, if I could just have that much money, if I could just have that kind of relationship, if I could just have that kind of influence, then I will be satisfied and happy and discover my best version of life. And Jesus's conclusion to his Sermon on the Mount is him declaring that he is the way that leads to that life. Which means we all have a choice. Every day when you wake up, you have a choice. You have a choice regarding how you're gonna treat your family, your teachers, your classmates. You have a choice about what thoughts you're gonna let just sit in your mind. You have a choice about the words you're gonna use to talk about other people or how you're gonna talk to people. You have a choice about how you're gonna respond to your sin or your shame or your stress and anxiety. Are you going to take the easy route and just do what you want because it feels good and it makes you happy? Are you gonna treat Jesus like someone who you believe in but not someone you're committed to? Or are you willing to journey down the difficult road of discipleship that often requires us to deny ourselves and our preferences for the sake of God and our neighbor. Jesus goes on in chapter seven to give a couple of examples of what it looks like when people choose their own way. And he concludes the sermon with a little parable that we looked at in week one, which leads me to my pastoral disclaimer and then my conclusion. I do not think that the heart of God is for any of us to be motivated by fear. I know that in settings like this, when young Christians can hear someone talking about making a choice, uh, God or not God, Jesus or not Jesus, heaven or hell, life or destruction, uh, I know sometimes that for young people, it can be tempting to choose Jesus out of fear of the alternative. But my reading of scripture is that God wants us to genuinely discover the beauty and the brilliance of Jesus and to follow him out of this place of love and gratitude, but at the same time, Jesus ends his most famous sermon presenting his audience with two ways of life, their way and his way. 
And he unapologetically says that people who choose their way will not experience the life that he has to offer, not in this lifetime or the next. Their end is destruction. But for those of us who have discovered in Jesus someone who is both good and true, someone who is both kind and king, well, then he calls us to the daily task of choosing him, of becoming someone who adopts the values and practices and lifestyle of Jesus. So today, I just wanna end where we started by reminding you that in life, we all make choices and then our choices make our life. The kinds of people that we become, the kinds of relationships that we develop, the impact that we have on the world and other people around us, they are all determined by the choices that we make and the way that we choose to live. So who are you following? Where have you maybe settled for what's easy instead of what's good? And what will you do today to choose Jesus's way over your own? The Sermon on the Mount is meant to be Jesus's vision for how you and I can, uh, yes, follow him and in that discover the life that he has to offer. The life that is marked by things like love and joy and peace far beyond any other version of life, but it requires us to make a choice. And, I, uh, and that doesn't just mean a choice that we make up here. Unfortunately, the temptation for young people who grow up in a faith context is to believe that because I've made the choice up here, then I'm good. But Jesus' invitation to follow him looks like a lifestyle. It looks like you making decisions this week to spend time with him. It looks like you making decisions this week to talk differently than the people around you. It looks like you making decisions this week to actually address some of the secret sin that you have in your life. The list goes on. The invitation of Jesus is a life that is not always easy, but it is always worth it. And anyone can choose him and follow him, but it takes a choice.